I welcome you to our Mysteria, our regular magical meeting, and it's not the first time that we are greeting each other here. But today is a special day. Today is our most favorite, most beautiful and magical celebration, which we so impatiently waited for and after which something good, something enchanting is usually bound to happen. Today is Beltane, a very ancient festivity. Its roots go deep into the depths of centuries, into the prehistoric, antediluvian time, when words that could describe these processes weren't even in existence. These processes used to be natural for everyone, and we partake in the mysteries and our mysteries yet again, thereby trying to revive this ancient knowledge within ourselves, in our consciousness, in our spirit, so that it becomes just as natural as it used to be to our ancient predecessors. To begin, let's first discuss what these celebrations are. Today's modern literature identifies eight pagan festivities which are defined within the wheel of the year. It quite dismissively refers to them as agricultural festivities. To note that the term agricultural carries more or less the same meaning in different cultures and has a certain dismissive folksy connotation. Thus, the way that people relate to it is also similar. But as you understand, all of that has a reason. And the fact that it entered tradition has its own reasons as well. In the times when our ancient pagan mysteries were replaced by the mysteries of the new gods, the stakes, of course, were being placed on the elites. The elites were converted first, and only then everyone else. This concept was injected precisely through the then ruling elites, through princes and kings, that the celebrations of these mysteries is unking-like, that it is something very peasant-like, that true kings don't get involved into these sorts of things, the true elite certainly doesn't get involved into these sorts of things. That is where the dismissive attitude started from. But something stalled the process. Regardless of the fact that all and everyone was converted into the new religion, the ways of the old did not disappear. And so, as it were, people continued to color the eggs, not for the purpose of knocking them together. And they fed the birds, and they ran around the woods in the night of May, as they do today, and they burned their bonfires on the Kupala night, or Litha, as it was called. And all the eight festivities were such natural ways of people's interaction with one another and the world, that erasing them from the collective memory proved to be incredibly difficult. So it was decided to replace them. They placed their symbols on top of them, covered them with their legends and their stories, changed their names, attached the powers of the gods onto saints, and began calling these days in honor of their saints. And that is how it was. The folk certainly agreed, sure, but it didn't disappear from memory completely. It remains sitting somewhere very deep. It is a certain ancient memory that can't be erased. It is passed on by blood. It fills the brain as the air that we breathe. And breathing it once, you will never be the same again. But everything is bound to come to an end. There is an end to untruth. There is an end to the mendacity of systems. And the ancient memory begins to awaken along with our old gods, which is already happening right now. It is unconcealable and it is absolutely evident and visible. So what are these eight points, eight marker festivities that we celebrate in our tradition? Eight moments at which we come to a standstill and something seems to happen at these moments within our consciousness. 
an attunement happens, an attunement of rhythms, of time, an attunement with an ancient legendary database that levels out everything within the mind and consciousness, that raises all that is deceitful and leaves behind that which is truthful. It all begins with Imbolc, a festivity that was celebrated on February 1st. On this day was the awakening of the air element. Yes, our festivities are connected to elements. On this day, the air element awoke, and we tried catching this air. We fed the messengers who brought this air to us. We fed the birds. We caught the word. We tried to hear a particular word, a word that would define the future, not for yourself, but for all. Somewhere, from some ancient worlds, from other dimensional kingdoms, a world flew over and reached our world. It didn't come without a reason. Changes transpire in all worlds, and these changes must synchronize with the rest of the worlds. If something happens in one world, it also happens in all others. We receive this information through the messengers. This information is first received by the priests. The priests open up their minds on Nimbolk and are the first ones to catch this word. The rest of people prepare to receive this word. And so, in a simple domestic way, they clean, clear out their households, thereby ritually opening up their common everyday world for something new, for something that will certainly come to be. And then there was Ostara, or Javaronki. During our earlier lectures, we discussed that these eight marker points, eight festivities, were cleverly shared between the Celtic and Slavic traditions. And the fact that we are linked by incredibly ancient forces, ancient roots, and maybe even blood, is certain. Ostara woke up the water element. And whatever the priests did at Imbolc, people began doing on Ostara. They caught information. They encoded that information through the ritualistic painting and coloring of the eggs. They offered these eggs to Earth. They gave her their dreams, because every coloring of an egg symbolized one's desire. Whether it was happiness or comfort that was desired, or perhaps a victory or maybe wealth, all of that was symbolized by certain cultural signage that used to be completely natural for the times when all of this happened. There used to be particular runic signs, inscriptions, and all of this was used to paint the egg. These were understandable words, understandable for that mind, and all of that was offered to the goddess, as to say, as your awakening, accept this goddess. This was Ostara, the day of goddess's birth, as if she was taking her first breath, awakening from the winter sleep, receiving this gift along with the wish, the wish for something that should be on this land. The priests, at this moment, were safeguarding the process, leading the ritual, leading the ceremonial part, helping people to formulate and form their wishes correctly. They told them the ancient legends of a beautiful goddess, a young maiden, who on that day and at that hour awakens along with the sun as the daylight turns to gain. And so today is Beltane we came to the third point. The earth element awakes. The mother goddess by the power of earth. We also discussed in our previous lessons that the eight marker points, all eight of our festivities, are one way or another connected to the mother goddess in her different hypostases, in her different forms. On Ostara, we honor the young maiden goddess. Now, we are honoring a grown mother. Or more precisely, a mother who is just getting ready to become a mother. It is a feminine power. 
which is about to come to its term, to its very essence. And so this was a very important festivity for the ancients. This one is a Celtic celebration as well. That is how they go, one after the other, Celts loves, Celts loves. So right now it is the Celts. And so Beltane was mainly spread among them. It wasn't as strongly present on the Slavic lands. Yes, there were May celebrations, there was the Maypole, but these two are echoes of the Celtic rituals. But among the Celts, the symbolism was very strongly developed. And for them, Beltane was practically the beginning of everything. And this festivity was considered to be the main one out of all the series of processes. And then comes the Kupala night, Lita, then Lugnasad, and then Mabon, and Samhain, and Yule. We close our series of festivities with Yule, the eighth celebration. First we welcome the elements as they awake, and then see them off as they wane. The last element to awaken this year, as in every year, will be fire. It will awaken on Kupala. After that the elements begin to fall asleep. The air element is the first one to wane. It falls asleep on August 1st. It is first to awaken and the first one to fall asleep. Next, the water element falls asleep on May Bone, the autumn equinox. Then comes Samhain, the earth element falls asleep. And Celts regarded this festivity as no less important, no less at all, and just as principal as today's day Beltane is. Next, the fire element wanes on Yule and we enter a 40-day period of absolute darkness, absolute timelessness, and so it repeats year after year. Every year the same ritual repeats itself, a ritual tied to all eight festivities. They are inseparable from one another because every preceding event serves as a foundation for the one that follows. Today's festivity stems from what happened on Ostara, and that what happened on Imbolc, of course. So what happened on Ostara and Imbolc? On Imbolc you caught your word, and on Ostara you read your fate. But this wasn't a human fate. It is a different kind of fate. You didn't ask the goddess for anything. As you caught the word, you understood that in this current, in this priestly current, it would be unwise to ask for something. Because you, in a potential, are already in possession of absolutely everything. But someone who possesses a lot also has a lot of responsibilities, namely helping others, helping your tribe, calculating various possibilities, thus by anticipating trouble, preparing to protect your own, by anticipating joy, leading your tribe towards it. This is what the ancient priests did. The tribe lived as they lived, but the priests helped them lead their lives. When you entered the mystery on Nimbolg, you stepped onto this path of priesthood. A priest doesn't want anything for themselves, same as any mage, and you probably felt it very clearly. Ostara taught you to see signs. We focused on two signs, a hare and an egg, the common signs of Ostara. The egg symbolized the proto-foundation tradition, and the hare symbolized the proto-foundation freedom. We cracked the egg to read the sign of tradition, only after the symbol of a white hair pointed us to an exit. An exit out of the never-ending wheel of repetition, an exit out of the inability to escape the common human fate, thereby stepping onto a slightly different path. And everyone experienced it at their own time. For some, the egg stayed put until the very last day. For others, it was cracked very early on, because all the signs came. And this is individual for every person. And you saw something when you cracked the egg, some kind of image that was there for you and you alone. And you took this image and together with this understanding, the understanding of your path, 
you came to Beltane, to the moment of the awakening of the earth element. And this is a third force, which is being unlocked before you, and it would be impossible without the revealing of the two that preceded it, because air and water unlocked for us something greater than just the elements. When those two elements meet, they form a current of time. And by taking this current, by working it into yourself, it changed your inner rhythmics, altered your pace of time. It tuned it to the temporal pace of the future, and you will not fall out of the space. You will sense it in your breathing. You will feel it on your fingertips. Thereby, when you enter Beltane, you enter it as someone who belongs, as someone who understands time and what it is composed of, what it is built out of. And at that moment, as in all the previous mysteries, you enter in two hypostases simultaneously, as simply a person and also as a priest. As a priest, you will be faced with fulfilling priestly functions, but as a person, you will be fulfilling human functions as well. So the fulfillment of these two functions simultaneously, in addition to what has been passed previously, will unlock before you the most interesting possibility to obtain a certain something just for yourself, to obtain it by right as a gift from the mother, a reward for loyalty, a reward for your power and perseverance. So this will be the goal of our mystery today. Somewhat unexpected, but it is so nonetheless. Where it is that you happen to be at the moment, is unimportant. You could be in your usual surroundings, in your room or your office. Maybe you are already next to a bonfire in the woods, alone or surrounded by like-minded people. It could be that you are on the road and are able to follow our conversation only here and there. All that is unimportant. The most important thing is that you are here, and that means that everything is as it should be, because the main events will start, of course, this very night. And they, I would say, are not even just individual, they are very intimate. Because the reunification with this force is different for each person. When we went through Ostara, Let's take a look at the three circles model. From the conjunctions point, in the middle of the circles of power, we move towards the water element, towards chaos. In order to get there, we had to overcome three causes, three obstacles. The first one is connected to the proto-foundation death. And as discussed before, it is a certain fear, to some extent. Fear before dark waters, dark obscurity, which gave you an understanding of what it is you are afraid to lose, that there is actually something out there that is important as well as unimportant to you. The proto-foundation freedom, the second water, revealed an understanding of what it is that you actually want. You had to drop the shackles of the former reality, former life, familiar images, familiar symbols and familiar existence in order to move towards something of your own, towards freedom. And then a cut of old ties and a launch of something new. And so these three stages that you overcame through the symbolic search for the hair, through the cracking of the egg, through overcoming your fear and all of it, you all have very well described it in our online forum. Thank you very much. This is truly helpful for all of us, because all of us in one way or another went through these similar stages, through these obstacles, immersing ourselves deeper and deeper into the 
Abyss, the abyss of chaos. But chaos is not merely a formlessness. Chaos is a building material which subsequently will be used to craft realities. And so now we will be immersing ourselves down into the earth element, which will show us its three obstacles, and they, of course, are also connected to the proto-foundations. Proto-foundations that draw us into the earth element, the proto-foundation hate, the proto-foundation evil, and the proto-foundation dark. It all sounds quite menacing, but we will try to unpack it in more depth, with an understanding that it is in fact not at all that scary if we would correctly understand the terminology. The Triune Mother Goddess, the Birthing Mother, the Protecting Mother, and the Nourishing Mother is also manifested in her three images. These three images can be found in every culture. In Celtic tradition, it is the Triune Bridget. In Slavic tradition, it is Živa, Lela and Marena, the Triune Goddess. But it was the Greeks who provided the best description of this image. It is beautifully written in all of its genealogy. There is the Goddess Demeter, the Goddess of Bearing, the Goddess of Fertility. She represents the innermost circle, the inner circle of existence, defined by the proto-foundations life, death, love and hate. Then there is her mother, the goddess Rhea, subsequently called Rhea Kibela, in connection with the Phoenician tradition. She safeguards the second circle of proto-foundations, evil, good, tradition and freedom. Rhea also has a mother, the primordial goddess, primordial force, goddess Gaia, a personified mind of our planet. Her power is the power of our Earth. And she safeguards the outer circle with its proto-foundations, dark, light, order and chaos. And all of these three goddesses as if emerging one from the other, are mythically expressed as the mother, maiden and crone. Because that way it was easier for people to remember who relates to whom and who derived from whom. But we will also look deeper. We will see that these three images, three incarnations, are in fact one and the same force. They are just personified in more or less understandable functions. The simplest and the most understandable function is fertility. The earth feeds us, the earth waters us, the earth keeps us warm. We see her, we sense her, we know her. And her name is Demeter, the fruit-bearing one. We will go through her hall through the proto-foundation hate. Well, what sort of proto-foundation is it? Every proto-foundation that we mention is a database. It is an informational database. When we pass through it, it is as if we leave something there and take something with us. So it is the same here. We will give something and we will take something. What it, will it be? When we pass through the proto-foundation hate, it will fully expose us in a way, and due to this exposure, there will be no more place for deceit. What will be left is an understanding of what it is that you truly want. One thing that you need. Only one thing. This entire process, the process of passage, was in its time geniusly written out by Mikhail Bulgakov, and you have most likely read his literary piece Master and Margarita, and may have even seen the movie. 
The way that the process of Margarita's formation was happening, how she too became bare and went through this proto-foundation, when she had to define, and as Korovyev said to her, you have a right to demand only one thing, only one. He emphasized these two words, demand and only one. We will talk about the first word at a later time, but for now about only one and how it relates to the proto-foundation hate. There is a particular one that remains, the most important thing, the reason why you needed all of this, the reason why you entered this mystery. And so when that is defined, the path continues towards the proto-foundation evil, to Rea's hall the most wise and bloodthirsty goddess. She does not forgive weaknesses nor foolishness. She safeguards the forbidden knowledge. Someone who passes through her obtains memory, true memory. Not all of it, of course, but precisely according to intention, the one that you came in with as you passed through the proto-foundation hate, only one. And so a new volume of memory forms to fit this only one. Memory that relates to this subject in particular, precisely to this goal of yours, precisely to this desire of yours. And this revelation is quite difficult to live through. Margarita experienced this revelation when she found herself at the ball, along with everything that she saw. When she receives rapists, poisoners, murderers and evildoers of previous eras, so was her ritual, while trying to save faith and at that moment becoming completely disillusioned. And the fact that she lost all her illusions allowed her to pass through the next hall and reach an impossible level, the level of Gaia. This is an ancient force and forbidden force, primordial force, elemental force. And so that is what she has received, this Bulgakov's heroine, Margarita. She said so herself, I was shivering naked and became a witch that very night. Yes, those who entered this mystery were the ones who searched for witch powers, ancient powers, not something superficial. And perhaps not even knowing anything about it, they entered the proto-foundation death through a simple desire of theirs. Let him fall for me. Let him marry me. Let me be rich. Let me be beautiful. Let me be young. But after passing through all these stages, there was nothing left of the original desire. Because when you pass, through the proto-foundation hate, you achieve a clear understanding of why you need it. And only the truth rises to the top. It is not beauty for the sake of beauty. It is not love for the sake of love. Nor wealth for sake of wealth. All of that is nonsense. When you pass through the proto-foundation hate and your consciousness becomes exposed as if sanded off by sandpaper, you realize that you actually need none of that. Because all of that is words. And in reality what you need is a power. Your power. Because if you have a power, everything else will be there. And it will be so unimportant that it will truly not be important. Behind these words, in all truth, stands a fierce longing for the lost power that every woman and man used to have, just in different functionalities. And so today we will be talking about this power and how to get it back. The roots of this festivity go deep into antiquity. 
Beltane translates to the fires of Bel. Bel is an ancient Celtic god. Belenos, he was called, or Tsernunos. Sometimes they called him Tsern, or just Bel. When visitors from the southern lands came to Europe, they associated him with Baal. This is not completely correct, different functions, but it is close, close nonetheless. That one was also considered to be the god of life. Baal means master, translated from Phoenician. Bel means light, white, fiery, pulsating. That is how it also could be translated. So it is one of the manifestations of the light god. The fires of Bel were lit on this night, not without a reason. On this night, the goddess chose a husband. And this night was a night of a ritual conception. The conception between the goddess of the earth and the one who she chose as her husband. One god as a man, whom that god entered, and the goddess as a woman, whom the goddess entered. And this was an ancient, very sacred ritual act, where no woman could refuse a carnal bound with a man by the bonfires of Beltane. Because at that moment she was a goddess. And he was a god, a horned god chosen by the goddess. They all received a sign. The maiden who acted as the priestess in this ritual had to naturally be virgin. And the man had to be the chosen one. And the goddess always chose the man herself. The priest did, of course, help, guided by certain signs, certain clues, according to certain divination or prophetic practices. The sign did come. The legends tell us that this sign came in different ways. Sometimes animals were the ones to point to a man or a woman. Sometimes a priest or priestess received the knowledge in their dreams who and according to which parameters the person will be fitting and should be chosen for the ritual. Irish sagas, very voluminous, very beautiful, describe these stories to us. For example, the future making should come wrapped in a blanket. So the circumstances would occur that someone on his way would get robbed. To co cover up, he would find an old blanket, and so he would come to the city gates wrapped in this blanket and be received as a king. Why is that? Well, the prophecy. Or missing a shoe. Or something else. There were many signs. There were signs. And so the chosen ones would come together for a night of love, she the priestess and he the anointed king. On this night they had to conceive a future king, who on Imbolc, of course, would cry his first cry, thereby giving new information that we won't be living according to the old ways any longer. The new leader is here. But this was for people. And people did these acts. And even during Christianity, they could not give up this festivity. It was said that it would be better to pick a fight with a pastor rather than with the goddess. Hurting or insulting the goddess was not allowed. Participation in Beltane was mandatory, and it was needed to light a great number of fires. This ritual was therefore called the ritual of the thousand fires of Bel. But why was it necessary to light thousand fires? You see, it was considered that there are many of those who want to prevent this conception, this marriage. Many want to be the goddess's husband themselves and thus to eliminate the chosen one. And so the people, along with the priests, 
thought of this right. They said, we will do as nature does. When a man and a woman conceive a child, and the man gives the woman his seed, only one of these seeds makes it. Only one. The most of the most. The rest of them have to die. So we will act as nature shows us. We too will light many bonfires, and out of all them, there will be only one that is real. The rest would serve as symbols. And similar to the curates that protected Zeus by making ruckus, singing songs and dancing in order to silence the cry of the newly born God, us too we commit to love, songs and dance as to confuse the alien intruders. They won't know where exactly the ritual conception will be taking place, since all of us are participating. So the people would do the same, understanding that in that moment they are protecting their goddess and the one that she chose. They are protecting them from those who want to interfere with this ritual, repeating the same action, understanding that although only one marriage will be sacred, all of us are protecting it from intruders by engaging in it. So that was a symbolism. At Beltane, people did the same as the priests had done during Ostara. The priests protected people and led the ritual. So now people instead of priests are protecting and leading the ritual. The chosen May Queen and the chosen May King came together in a ritual marriage in order to bring forth a new ruler, chosen by the earth and by gods. This is why you could not, under no circumstances, stay home that night. And people, regardless of all pastoral prohibitions, whether they understood it or not, they just knew that on that night they must go into the woods. Then be as it may be. They may whip you, beat you, some they may even burn at the stake. But that would be not worse than not going to the woods to light the bonfires of Beltane, not to find your passion, not to come together in love's ecstasy, this wonderful night. Because on this night, every woman becomes a goddess and every man becomes a god. Even if just for this night. Later on, this festivity that was impossible to kill had to be covered in lies which is a matter of fact, was done. But again, this too wasn't that successful, because the lies somehow didn't stick to it as easily as imagined. And the forbidden fruit became even sweeter to the taste. They called it the Valpurgis Night. This name came about later, during the time of Christianization. Two Valpurgis were found brought out of the woodworks. The first one came from the islander cells, a saint from some Scottish monastery, the second one from Germany, a Valpurgis as well. She was some sort of a saint as well, but all of that, you know, is extremely far-fetched. But they had to veil this thing up somehow. If something is being worshipped by people to that extent, and if it is impossible to destroy, then a new legend must be created. So this is how it found its way into tradition, the Valpurgis night. And it wasn't even directly related to the doings of these so-called saints. Later they rewrote the story that they could cure, that they could do some sort of healing with their hands, but those were later additions. But traditionally, on the eve of May 1st, on the May night, all Celtic folk gathered at these Sabbaths. 
and they gathered exactly because of this ancient memory that got awakened that night. You had to go. Because if we wouldn't go, then there may be no harvest, nor life, and the new king would not be born. None of that will come to be, which means that we had to go, had to sing, had to dance, as the later spread around by the pastors to do obscene things and to kiss the goat god Pan's behind. Their imagination is quite perverted. But still, the people gathered. In every town, in every place, there is always a spot that has a strange name. Where strange, just as strange people would gather. And it is usually called the Bald Mountain. And it is called that way in every place. Take any of them. If there is a mountain that is a rumored gathering place for witches, it will always be bald. Maybe because that area is trampled by their excessive dancing. But overall, of course, the term bald mountain, and that is where everyone should gather, goes deep into that same antiquity we mentioned. Antiquity lies at the source of this festivity, when the god and goddess united in a place called Sita, the dwelling place of an otherworldly folk, good neighbors, or fairy, as Celts call them, or Divi Ludi, as Slavs call them. They lived in the hills, as it was told. Divi Ludi sometimes lived in caves or in the mountains. The Celts believed that their fairy, their good neighbors, lived in the hills. And so the gathering had to take place by a hill, not on top of the hill, but specifically next to it, as to be able to circle the hill around the base and light the fires along that circle, thereby forming a sort of protective ring, a force filed to protect the wedding night of the king and the queen, to shout, to sing songs, and so on, meaning to actively act as kurits, diverting the attention to themselves. It was believed to be the protection from the evil spirits, but the evil spirits meaning invaders, meaning those who wanted to capture earth for themselves. And the Irish legends tell us about it as well. The Book of the Taking of Ireland describes the way that gods on this land replaced each other and specifically tells us that the Partholan folk, the first folk, came to the Celtic land Arian, the Eve of Beltane, and later the Tuatha de Danan, the folk of the goddess Dano, also came on the Beltane Eve and later fought the Partholan folk for this land, and by winning, the Tuatha gods themselves became the lords of this land. And then people, under the name of the Sons of Miles, also came on Beltane, and also subsequently fought the Tuatha folk and won. This coming, this change of husband, it always happens exactly on the eve of Beltane, and it is always a symbol. The goddess chooses on her own, but she will choose the best one, the strongest one. And if she is protected at that moment, if her individual choice is allowed to happen, then she will choose a husband from whom is to be born the real, true king. The king of past and future, as the Celts called him. They called King Arthur that way, thinking that it was he who was rightfully conceived on Beltane night and born on Imbolc night. A rightful king, an impeccable king, a king whom the mother 
as to her own son, will pass on all her rights, granting him the ability to rule over all lands and people. It was a very important figure for the ancients. And this figure has not gone away. In one form or another, in one way or another, people still desire a powerful leader, desire someone who will make a decision, who will explain, who will translate. Many thousands of years have passed, yet nothing changed. People remain the same. Maybe that is why Beltane is still here, because only on this night the miracle is able and possible to happen. A miracle that people don't even really deserve, neither with their actions nor with their thoughts, although still have a right to. And this right is possible only in the case if the Earth Goddess herself says yes. An old belief told us that there were times when invaders came to the celebration and tried to take the young priestesses by force, who at that time personified the power of the Earth. The same legend said that if that is to take place against the will of the priestess, the conception would not happen. Such was their power. It was impossible to do this against her will. And here, every woman who enters the realm of Beltane symbolizes the goddess and follows her journey. And people, too, by protecting her, also receive the right to something impossible. For people this day is a chance to solidify their right to choose their fate on their own. They already told all of their desires to the goddess on Ostara. And today, coming to Beltane, there is a sort of agreement. People said to the goddess, we accept your will and the one who you chose for your husband will be our king and the son who will be born will be our ruler. But in return, we would like to live according to our will, not as serfs and not under someone else's law. We would like to have the right to make our own destiny as we chose it. Such was the agreement, an agreement between gods and people. And so the people would take on these responsibilities, that the will of a mother is most important, that mother's will is the main thing. And a woman, becoming the essence and the power of the goddess on this night, does just the same. She receives that same right that Korovyev mentioned. The only right to demand, to demand your power. So that is what we will enter this mystery with, demanding our own power. Is this something that is only allowed for women? In this way, yes, it is. And men, they're allowed something else. When entering the space of Beltane, a man would be happy if the power of the horned god, the ancient Cernunos, would touch his essence and he would become the chosen one. A man would be happy if he hears the mother's call and learns what it is, because there is nothing better in this world. A man would be happy if he felt himself as a warrior, protecting the goddess on this night and nobly accepting her choice if she happened not to choose him. Everyone will go get what is theirs. When demanding the power of a witch or receiving the right to freedom of a witcher. Since there were a lot of fires lit, 
All these lights in the realm and in the night of Beltane form together a sort of a network. At the same time, the priest said that this network extends not only within one territory, it extends throughout all the worlds. And precisely on this night, it was possible to establish a connection with other realities, where the fires of Beltane were being lit as well, where too the goddess is uniting with the god. On this night, in other realities, other realms, on other territories, and in different times, the border between the worlds and timelines gets erased and everything connects together but only one fire is real only one fire that symbolizes the conception in ireland ancient ireland they knew this very well and it was believed that only priests druids and volks know the location of the true fire according to specific signs and that it was believed that it was necessary for the priest to take this sacred fire and to lit every hearth within that land. There was even a specific ritual, a buy-off of fire from a druid, meaning that everyone came with their own bowl, gave a piece of bread or something else and received a spark of fire in return, which he used to lit up his own hearth with. It was believed that if one is to light a hearth from someone else's fire, that house will see trouble, because it was a symbol of a barren fire. It wasn't a fire that was lit in honor of the goddess. It is a decoy fire. Whereas the priest, he would have the true fire. Back then they didn't yet learn to lie, and so overall we can say that within this symbolism there was no deceit. Nowadays it is different. Nowadays, every fire of ours that we light, whether in form of candles or bonfire, it is a connection. It is a symbol that we too are participating in this conception. We too are participating in the insemination of earth. We do not have a priest who will point it out for us and say that this fire here was the fire of Bell. And the couple that was coupling next to it was the one who conceived the king. No, of course not. But at any time it could happen, any time it could be that it was your fire that was the one, or the fire lit by your friends and colleagues, because everything is tied together and there is no difference any longer. The most important thing is to light those thousand fires, to establish that connection. And if at that moment, on some sort of a fluke, a conception happens, you would feel it instantaneously spontaneously, as if it happened with you. And so you will know that the ritual is complete and the new God will be born on Kupala and everything will turn out well. But everyone is doing their own part. And we are about the force, about the mystery, always in the search of a power. Although we cannot really say that it is one thing for people and another thing for witches. If people wouldn't fuel these fires using their power, if they wouldn't repeat all the ritualistic acts which need to be repeated, witches wouldn't have it easy, and all wouldn't be well for them either. Because this chance comes once a year, and sometimes could happen once in a lifetime to go after your power and to demand it. We will try to do this. We will try to go through it.